You're always going to find something very different and that is going to impact your life, yeah. of life. I know. didn't even say how to, how to say graduated cylinder in English. I mean, this, my lab, everyone was Spanish. We spoke Spanish the whole time. And later I needed to use everything that was in the lab. I, I was there and I couldn't say the word. It was truly frustrating. But you're going to be fine. I still sometimes joke with my lab mates and I tell them that what Delia was saying. I, you should see how smart I am in Spanish. I always joke about that because that's another, that's like another challenge that you might have. Especially when you get mad and you Okay, I think it's 6.32, so we can start. And I'll just make like a very brief introduction for the people that never joined. So we started by your room as a seminar series for a biology. And it was intended for a biology audience um, but then in the second edition we decided to expand it so we're doing also part of career development and a part on science communication that will come after so this is the second meeting of career development i'm very excited for this meeting and uh, elia and carmen will share this meeting and it's about postdoc pitch so i'll leave you guys the word for this welcome everybody so Elia, we agreed that you were going to start because in this way, everyone will have opportunity to speak and I will not be the only one like for one hour speaking. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so much pressure. Okay, so hi everyone. It's really nice to see you here. Uh, some of you are known faces, some of you are new faces, which is always cool. Um, so I will start basically by briefly introducing myself uh, and uh, Carmen as well. We are co-hosts today. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I am a currently postdoc in the second postdoc in the lab of Professor Ludovic Telli at the University of Lausanne. I was born and raised in Italy and I did my PhD in France. So I've more or less been Europe centric and let's say in terms of subject, I mean, it's not really going to be the topic of today's talk, but I am mostly a developmental neurobiologist and kind of turned into bioinformatics recently. And uh, well, Carmen, I think it's your turn to introduce yourself. Okay, thank you very much, Alia. So uh, I am Carmen, I am Spanish, and I was born and raised Spanish, and I also remained there for my PhD. So I did my PhD in Spain, in Valencia. I'm astrocyte lover, so that's, I think, one of my main characteristics, but of my life, not only about my research. I really love astrocytes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, now I'm doing my postdoc in the U.S. I moved two years and a half ago, and I started at Virginia Tech. So I am at the Franklin Biomedical Research Institute in Roanoke that I had no clue of where it was before moving here. So that was like some kind of a big transition. I could experience both worlds. It's like the South European, because honestly, I think it's slightly different than North European uh, scientific culture and American uh, scientific culture. And I like both, but I think I prefer the American one. No offense to all my Southern European <laughs> friends, but that's a, there's a reason why we moved, obviously. And um, I think it's very exciting to do this, about tips about postdocs. But to be honest, and uh, we were discussing this when we were preparing this with Elia, with Carmen, we are, haven't succeeded in this step, in this stage yet. So it's a bit strange to be here sharing our tips and our advices. But on the other hand, I think that I wish someone had told me some of the things that before I begin or when I was beginning. So I think it was, it's nice to have the opportunity to share what I learned so far in the years I've been doing my postdoc and also talk about how I envision the next years that are coming. So even if I haven't transitioned to the next stage, I think it's a great opportunity to really talk about what we want to do and how we think that, 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 that we can be successful and by success again the most important measure of success of success for me it's like happiness and uh, fulfillment so that is what i want to say today and i hope i really have a very productive discussion about how to achieve what we want in our postdocs we could maybe call it a medical success <laughs> somehow so we can start with the first topic of today. So we have a good list of juicy, spicy topic for today. And the first one is how to choose a postdoc. So this is, you know, aimed uh, mostly at people that might be at the end of the PhD and wonder 
should I do a postdoc and how do I do a postdoc and what is even a postdoc? So thing is, why in fact do you decide to do a postdoc? So in the normal transition of things, you know, this is what you're told, you do a PhD, then you do a postdoc, and then you magic happens and you become a professor, no? But this is, <laughs> you know, not entirely how things might work. And there are steps in between that one should think about when even just deciding how to, to do a postdoc. So, so what is your goal? Let's say you have to, to take a postdoc. I think that one good idea to have in mind when you want to choose this place where to go or this topic where to go is what am I going to get about this? So am I just going to, let's say, extend what I have been doing in my PhD because, you know, you like the topic, you like the kind of research, which is good, but you kind of have to weigh whether this is enough. You know, how is this going to advance your uh, your position, advance your knowledge and advance your ability to maybe then transition either as a, to a professor position or maybe somewhere else. You know, it's perfectly fine to say, I want to do this postdoc because I want to learn this specific thing because I know it's very useful to actually do something else. What I wanted to mention is, I think what Delia is saying, it's, it's very, very important for one reason. When we finish our PhD, we're so tired. We're totally fed up of what we've been doing for so many years. We really want to move. And sometimes I think it's very easy to enter in the automatic pilot and not really see it as what do I want to do next, but just like sleep down in, in a new position and just try to forget about what you were doing before. And, and I think someone should advise us like to start way before we are going to submit our dissertation and everything to really think what we want to get out of it what do i really want to achieve in the long term and this is this postdoc is going to be a tool to arrive to that place and we're going to be totally tired of what we were doing before but you still need to think about that and and if it's my, staying in academia real my final goal or not because if it's not maybe it's more convenient for me to leave now and go to to industry or whatever whatever i want to do that is going to make me happier and it's fine it's a totally fine answer for that and if it's not the case what do i want to get out of my post job do you want to learn skill that's going to help me to get another kind of job do i want to stay in academia or not and do i want to do the same thing that i was doing in my phd and, and for instance, my case, I did my PhD mainly in molecular biology. So when I decided to, to do my postdoc, I was trying to find a person that was more a glial biologist. So I could complement both things like glial biology, more neuroscience, more cell biology with my molecular biology tools. And I can become like a more complete researcher from my point of view to address the questions that I'm interested in. I can perhaps share my experience in that. I totally agree with you. Um, I think what I did when I was, well, first of all, I, I stayed like one year more after my PhD, which is something that not really recommended, but I really wanted to stay because I really liked my lab and my PhD. I liked my project. I wanted to finish it. So I no regrets about that. Uh, but as last time we were saying there is a timer after the PhD and so better to move sooner than later. But anyway, so I had the time during that year to think about what I really wanted to do. And when I was doing application for my postdoc and then my well my first requirement for my postdoc was being independent so that was like the first thing that I was looking in, in a professor for my postdoc and probably because that was really the only thing that I was missing during my PhD I mean I was independent in the sense that in the experimental designs and everything but not in the types in the in the scientific questions so I really wanted to challenge myself and think about a whole project from the beginning to the end. And that's how I chose my, my postdoc. And that gave me, like Carmen was saying, the opportunity to sit down and do something that for my whole PhD, I, I did like just automatically, but at, at, for the first time I was doing that because I wanted to do it. And I studied a lot of literature and I really decided, okay, I want to study this. I want to move my research from a little bit from development to evolution. And I want to do this, this and this. And, and that, that really like, yeah, pr pushed me to, to do like, um, to start in my new project. And that was really exciting actually. So I, I really recommend to do that if you have the chance to do it. I don't know what the other experience for the other postdocs here. I'm Christina for those of you who don't know me and I 
I think, yes, this is my fourth year of postdoc now here. And I would like to say, yes, I agree with both Carmen's that uh, you should really think about it before going for a postdoc, because if you're torn, if science and research is for you or not, then don't do it because it's a, a real commitment. It's even more a commitment than doing a PhD. I'm still happy with my choice, uh, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying it's important to think about it. They're right about that. For the part where we're talking about how to pick your new lab, uh, my experience is very different from all the others. I remember last time in the last meeting, we were talking about um, making a list with pros and cons of all the labs and stuff. Nothing of that happened to me. Well, first of all, when I defended, I said, I will never go to US. It's too far. I'm not going to go. I want to stay in Europe. I, I went in France for my uh, PhD period abroad and I really liked there. So I was hoping to go back there. But then this visiting professor came to my university right after I defended and he was looking for a postdoc with my skills and he was like so are you coming or not in May and I was here in September I don't know what happened but I was very excited by the ideas that he had for his own lab and it was a, a lab that just started so he he became a PI basically four months before I arrived here and so I want to talk about that as well, because you should definitely look what, once you're looking for your postdoc on what you want to do, because if you pick a very young PI, then you're going to do many things and you're going to start from putting the bulbs in the rooms, right? Um, so you're going to start from the very beginning. And I think that that might be for some a waste of time, but on the other hand, it's going to give you an idea of how it's going to be when you're going to be come a PI. No one is going to put the bulbs in the room for you, right? So you have to think about everything. And so that, yes, I think my timeline is kind of low right now, but on the other sense, I'm doing so many things and I set up so many techniques in the lab that I feel like I'm more complete in that sense. Well, before I was just an expert in my own technique. So I think that's very important. And another very huge advice that I can give to people. If you really like having your home free time and you believe in the family values, just pick a PI that has a family. That's very important because otherwise you're gonna be in a loop where they don't understand why you don't wanna go in the lab during the weekends and stuff like that. And I'm the first one that I'm always here in the weekend if there is a deadline, but if, like, if it's not necessary, we don't need to go necessarily every weekend so picking a pi with a family and kids perfect I, of I course should. mine has no family just to be clear um <laughs> I, I look for for pis for it with kids too yes i did that <laughs> so that's my experience i'm very thankful that you're sharing your experience i think you made very good points uh when we were discussing about choosing the mentor last time we didn't go uh, a lot about the difference between choosing a very experienced or senior mentor compared to a very young mentor. And I think it's important at every level, but I think when you're a postdoc, you leave it in a different uh, way because normally you should have more responsibilities. So it can also mean that if you're at a certain position, you're with a person that's starting, you need to get involved in so many other things. I, I do agree with Christina because that's also my experience. So I did my PhD with a senior scientist and later I am doing my postdoc with a very young PI and I also perceive that and I think that that's also a very good point. And the family, I think that talking about how your PI appreciates free time, it's very important, but my PI doesn't have a family and she respects that well, yeah, way she, more. She, she's <laughs> unique, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> choose unique PIs is another advice. She, she's <laughs> also going like to the beach for two weeks and write three papers. Like she's not normal, I'm sorry. <laughs> we yeah. love her, but she's not normal. <laughs> Fair point. So Melissa <laughs> wanted also to share her experience if I'm not wrong, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think too, um, for me, I'm aiming towards faculty in the end. And I think some good advice that I got was to think about what the lab you envision yourself running will be at the end of your PhD and think about 
how it incorporates what you did in your PhD, but won't compete with that mentor and what you need to gain from a postdoc, then you can kind of average them together and have your own niche that doesn't compete with either previous lab. So like for me, I was in a neurodegeneration lab studying astrocytes and now I'm in a neurotrophin lab and I'm eventually gonna average that and study astrocytes and their networks and A2 astrocytes in particular. So I'm trying to find like different pieces of the puzzle that combine into the right fit in the end. But as far as picking a PI, what, what really stood out to me with the PI that I ended up with was that he made sure when I was doing my interview that I stayed in postdoc housing so that I knew what it would be like to be here. He made sure I had dinner with only the female people in the lab so that I could ask them whatever I needed to ask them. He arranged for me to interview with other PIs at the same university so that I could see what the network was like or if someone else here would be a good fit and get me introduced to other people around here. So I think all of that and being so thoughtful about each of those things told me that he cared that I was happy. So really think when you're on your interviews about like what your PI is trying to show you and that's really important. And then when you're actually a postdoc, you no longer really have a committee. You can at some places, but mostly you don't. So it's your job to go and find other PIs that might be able to help you at the same university. And it's important that you build a network where you are and don't just stay in your own lab. Get ideas and go to conferences or seminars and really branch out as best you can. Yeah. If I can add, in fact, to what Melissa was saying, uh, I think really the the good thing that you can do in a postdoc is have a place when, in fact, you can expand as much as you can your uh, your network and your collaboration. I think this is really one of the, the richest things that you can have. So usually, once you are at that stage, you know you are capable of you know dealing with uh, biological question, and you might actually feel that you are kind of hungry. That you know you have your project probably in your lab. And sometimes I found myself in saying, okay, this is, you know, a bit too limited, and, but I, I still need to do it because, you know, that's your main project. And for me, kind of a solution to this was I had the chance to, um, to get into some collaborations and some of them were you know, still in, the, in, in my field and some of them were a bit of a, an outside thing. And, you know, that allowed me to experiment a lot of different things. And this is also important for, as uh, Melissa was saying, you have to find a compromise of what you want to do and where you have come from. Because you cannot be doing the same thing. And especially if you kind of want to stay more or less in the same area, you need more or less to make a chess game from, you know, where you are, where you've been, where you might want to go in terms of establishing your lab. There's like some bubbles of space around those areas that they don't have to collide. You don't have to um, do things that are too similar if you want to stay physically close to those people. And I think this, is, this might be more concrete thing here in Europe. I don't know if in US that's, uh, that's felt too much, you know, this thing of, well, you really have to move from one place to another to, uh, to have the opportunity to go on. Here in Europe, this is definitely a thing. So a lot of the grants that you can get, uh, go and look at where you have been. Uh, and if you've been, you know, in a place that is too close and you want to do something that is too close to where you want to go, it's not going to be seen very well. So this is also one thing of the planning and kind of thinking in, adv in advance of what to do and where. Uh, yeah, I think in US versus Europe, there is a different um, conception of the postdoc duration and, and how it should be in terms of like one lab versus multiple labs. So I think that here it, it is preferred and people are pushed to do one longer postdoc, like several years of postdoc, like another PhD, and then just jump to the um, PI position after that. Instead, in Italy, it is like more two years, one year, two years, one year to, to do what you're doing, what you were saying, like to gather different experiences. I, I don't have any, I mean, I, I think I 
I was more for a longer postdoc, but now I'm thinking, well, I, I think I've learned what I need to learn in this lab. Probably I need another postdoc. So um, it's like, it's a balance always. So yeah, what do you think? I don't know if that's um, an actual thing or if it is an, an artifact of the fact that most of European um, postdoc fellowships are two years long. This is what, you know, people think, okay, you are coming here for a postdoc and you might want to look for a fellowship. And this is the general advice. If you want to do a postdoc, try at least to get a fellowship, even if, even if you are paid uh, by your own lab, because this is going to be a huge increase in your CV, for sure. And most of them are just two years. I think there's just um, uh, human frontier that is three years. Some of them can be extended, but that's generally the length. So you know. I think, I think in could. US too. Yeah. In US too, it's two years, the average of the fellowships. No? I mean, the fellowships, not the transition grants, which is also two years, actually, of postdocs. Transition but. grants are two years, but uh, fellowships, it depends. Like one year. One year, two years. it can be yeah. four years, as far as I know. Okay. It depends a lot. On, on the on the type as you were saying it, if it's a foundation if it's NIH if it's mm -hmm. NSF I think they can change a lot but I guess money play a role because here there's more money so it's like easier to stay in the same lab perhaps because here, you can get multiple yeah. ones I, I, I don't guess. know as I was saying I don't know that much about northern Europe and um, maybe Emma could have a better idea or Tahira could have a better idea and then I do um, Aliyah was exp explaining his experience too but at this what I have seen and what I know for also my friends that are in, in, in Europe. The difference mainly is that in in the US, you don't depend that much, that much on the fellowship because the grants are much bigger. So your PI normally can pay you more easily. So even if you don't get the fellowship, you can still be here for many yeah. years. And that that is my opinion, the, the, the biggest difference. Because that's also something that we may, many times we forget and the most expensive, and also that's like an advice for future PIs and for everyone, the most expensive thing in research is salaries. Our people are the most expensive thing. It's not like the reagents, it's not the technique that you're going to do. I mean, maybe if you buy a microscope, okay. Also, for instance, animals are pretty expensive when you're working with them, but normally what is going to be more money, it's going to be hiring people. And that's what makes, in my opinion, the difference between American versus European one. It's how much amount they give you because that determines how big your team can be and how stable your team can be. That is a very important aspect of it. And I was, I was curious, uh, I, I, that's like calling you out, but, but Jake, I would like to know your, because you were saying that you were discussing about that and I wanted to know your experience. So how it is perceived in Australia, because I know that, we're always talking about, yeah, Europe versus America, but we're lucky enough that we have people from other places. So I would be very, very happy to hear about your experience and how they discuss about if you need to move or not, short, longer uh, postdoc. So what do you think? I literally, like I, I, I was saying in the chat as well, we had a special meeting today um, with the director, all the postdocs, a live Q&A. And there was questions at it as well, where someone said, it's always recommended that oh you go overseas to do a postdoc and then you come back, apply for fellowships, it looks better. But then someone told someone said today that nowadays you need to diversify your funding. The director said that actually. Um, that you need to diversify your funding. Here there's a few funding bodies. But apparently a lot of them also source their grants, fellowships from the US as well, the Howard Hughes and also, um, what's the other one? There's one that they, they mentioned, the NIH as well. So they're diversifying a lot of their funding, not just from Australia, but also from overseas as well. So in that sense, they were recommending that you should go overseas, make some network, come back, and then your funding diversifies. Um, so I think that was quite interesting because I never thought about that. But then there's also a lot of people who cannot move overseas, right, for various reasons, like family, you know, or like, you know, other commitments or just lots of things. But they said that it's fine if you can, it's still okay to stay in the same country, at least in Australia anyway. Uh, it's not too bad, but um, yeah, that was my impression. Um, I'm still new to this as well in Australia. It's relatively new. And coming to Elliot's point that, you know, you need to apply for your own fellowships, right? It's interesting because when I started my postdoc literally a few months ago, they were like, oh, it's fine. You don't have to apply for your own fellowship. And I was like, but it'd be good on my CV, right? And like, yeah. And I'm like, 
okay, but they're not really pushing me. They're not pushing me to do it at all. They're like, oh, you can do it whenever you want. I'm like, okay, sure. So thank you very much for touching the topic, Jay, because that's something we wanted to say in this and we were discussing about it, that it's like, should I apply to this? And the answer is obviously yes, because they're not going to hire all because of your science. They're also going to hire you because you can bring money to your institution because institutions are maintained with the overhead and with all the funding that people bring. And that is a fact. So if you can, if you have like less publications, but you brought a lot of money to your institution already being a postdoc, you're going to have good chances of get a job, getting a job. People are not going to say, but, or yes, it depends on how honest they are, but that is something that it's true. And the very important topic, when does the, the timer start? And it's immediately after you defend. And people forget that. So sometimes we say, yeah, I'm going to stay slightly longer in my lab so I can finish this paper and I can finish that and I can look for this and I can look for the other thing. You are wasting your time for applicability. Your applicability is going, your eligibility for these fellowships are going to start counting. And not only for the postdoc ones, also the ones for young PI, young investigators, awards, everything. So my advice, it's as soon as you defend, you should have already figured out what you want to do in your postdoc and move as fast as you can. I mean, that, I think that it's something that can really help you. That doesn't mean that you're going to fail if you don't do that. I'm not saying that because I don't think it's the case. But I wish someone would be like really telling me, pay attention to this small detail about how long you stay in your lab after you finish. The harsh truth and the facts. Yep. This is it. I mean, if you look at any fellowship grant, whatever professorship aimed at young scientists, the first eligibility criteria you will find has to do with years after PhD. And they don't count whether you have left the lab of your PhD right after or one year after your PhD. That is all time that has been spent, uh, that has been not spent on something else that you might have been doing. And uh, yeah, this is unfortunately not said that loud too much. And is one thing that, y you know, we can really, for no reason, because uh, it's true that, you know, a person staying in the lab where they did PhD just because they wanted to finish uh, the, the paper and nobody was staying there. I mean, it's, yeah, it's the, normal, it's the most normal thing one could think of doing. And, you know, I have this thing, I have to push it through. And this is why I'm staying here, just because otherwise things won't go as fast. Well, put this in, uh, in a balance. So it's not all win-win, unfortunately. So just take that into consideration very carefully when, when you decide eventually to extend the period there. And usually, in fact, the PI tend to tell you, just get out. Just as you finish, get out. If, you know, yeah. if, if they know more or less how things work, then they will also tell you the same thing. Just as soon as you maybe try and extend your PhD defense. You know, if you can, in some places, you can ask for grant that extend the period of time that you can just spend as a PhD. Yeah, uh, sure, you might get a little bit less money, but I mean, whatever, you know, you just extend a few months your PhD, then as soon as you defend, you get away. You know, that's the best deal you can think of. You know, you, you actually get your extended time in the PhD lab to finish what you were doing, but you don't lose any precious postdoc time. You know, postdoc is like, a transition phase you know it's the time that the grain of sand stands in the middle of the hourglass in fact postdoc didn't exist before like a long time ago before no so many people did science postdoc wasn't even a thing you know you could move directly to become a professor so this is like a new thing that we have and also i mean if you have a good mentor that mentor is going to advise you to move as soon as you can because what we are saying but it's also true that at some point, the, the, you don't have common interest with your PI from your PhD as much as you can think of. And I'm going to try to reframe it, even if it's a great person or whatever. At some point, you're going to be a super trained PhD that could be a postdoc actually, but you're going to be paid less and you're going to be already in your comfort zone. So your PI can play that card in its adva his advantage, you know? So you need to really 
be wise and remember what is better for you and how it is better. So, oh yeah, Melissa touched another very good point and I'm going to try to go back to that one. That was like postdoc community. So meeting other postdocs, meeting other PIs, having programs that are going to help you through your postdoc. And I think it's a very good point because for instance, when I arrived to my institution, I felt quite isolated because we didn't have enough we didn't have a lot of postdocs. It was quite a small institute. Now it's growing. We're trying to start a postdoc association here in Roanoke, but also we have the Neuroscience Postdoc Association. And I think that that's also a key element that it's, it can help you to develop other skills and it can help you to have like workshops to help you. It can help you to guide you. You can even have like a mentor in there. So I think that networking and um, and arriving to a place where you have a postdoc community can also have be a great element and they can also teach you what you should start fighting as soon as you arrive because as Carmen was saying before something that it's cool is that you can have your line that you're going to bring to your future lab and it's never too soon to discuss that with your PI and sometimes we are like too embarrassed of trying to say hey what I'm going to bring to my future lab even if it's my first day of my postdoc it can like look too ambitious but I think it's better to put the cards on the table from the very beginning and you show what you want to do and what is your point and what you're aiming and avoid problems in the future so that that is what I think it's better for instance for me I waited until my I was one year and a half or two years in to really discuss the topic I was going to bring to my lab I don't think that has been a problem but I am very happy I'm very glad I did like soon enough before starting to apply to my transition uh, grants and 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 everything so everything is clear and we I'm not going to be competing with my PI we can really diversify and start to do different things yeah I think that just a quick thing to follow up on this I think it's easier for more established PIs than with younger PIs because I have the feeling at least like speaking with other uh, probably Carmen you have a different experience but speaking with other people in my same institute when they are with younger PIs they are more like um not forced, but like they, they, they are supposed to do and advance the younger PI research because they're trying to establish their name in the field and in the lab. So while when you work with more established PIs that also already have like different lines of research, they care about publications, but they care less about novelty of their um, research. So they would agree more, I think, to allow you to have a personal line of research and then you can bring it with you and you can just like touch their skills but like do not do exactly what they are interested in yeah i i actually think so that was something i asked in my interview mm -hmm. i asked like what data can i bring with me to my own lab i'm aiming in this direction and that was the main reason i chose the lab i'm in because all of my data in my postdoc in this lab i'm bringing with me but that's because i chose a really established pi who doesn't mind for me to do entirely my own stuff, pretty much. Um, as long as it's generally related to his lab, it's fine. And I think that's a really important thing to ask during your interview is what do you want me to leave with you and what do, can I bring with me? And if I'm working on this in the future, do you mind? That's like so, so if you're with a super young PI, you can also have an advantage that happened to me. So my PI didn't tell me you can bring this or that, because on the other hand, if you decide too soon, it can be also a bit risky because you don't know if the project is going to work. That is also something. But what she told me is, look, I'm now fighting with my previous PI because I brought this line and now he wants to be competing with me and that's not nice. So I'm not going to do the same thing to you because it's stupid to be fighting and uh, competing with each other. So at a certain point, we're going to sit down and we're going to discuss what you take and what I keep and how we do things. So we didn't decide at that exact moment, but from the very beginning, it was very clear that she was going to give me something that I could start to in my new lab. So I'm very glad that at least I knew that that was going to happen. And the fact that she was so young, she was struggling with not having done it like clear enough. So that can also be an advantage. She's facing what you're going to face very soon. And she can oh, be totally. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. I think as long as you know going into it what it is that the arrangement is, that's the, the key. All right. So I think that for sake of going forward with our list, we could directly transition to what skills to build. I think we have more or less also gone to the how to transition to PI topic. 
while we have spoken, uh, unless someone has um, something in particular to say about this. I have last thing to say, and it's more thinking of Tahir because I know she's now looking for, for a, a postdoc. And this is also some ad advice that I, I wish someone gave to me. When I finished my PhD, I, I mean, I had done a terrible PhD. I mean, I'm going to lie. I mean, not fully my fault, but partially my fault, of course. And I'm not embarrassed of saying that. It's fine to say that we failed and no problem with that. But the thing is, I only had one first author paper. That's all I had. It wasn't even a good one, you know, because not. So that's how it was. And, and I thought I was not competitive enough. So... What I thought is, okay, I'm not going to apply to any open position because no one is going to get me. If they're having like 10 other CVs, they're going to prefer any other person before me. On one hand, that's like bad because I didn't trust myself. But on the other hand, and the other hand that was good because what I did is, okay, I'm going to select the labs I really want to go. I'm going to select the people I really want to work with. And I'm going to look for a mentor that has what I'm looking for. And I'm going to write to them and tell them why I love what I'm doing and why I'm so passionate about to work with them. And if it works, it works. And you know what? It worked in the first <laughs> round. So I just wrote to my PI and say, hey, I know who you are. I know what you've been done. I really admire you. I know you opened your lab and I would be super happy to work with you because I love this and this and that. And I'm good at doing this and this and that, but I want to work with you. And she didn't have funding the moment I wrote to her, but she told me, okay, let's start to apply to fellowships and see what happens. And one month later, she wrote to me that she got another one and she hired me. You know, so it worked. And, and that's the thing. Don't be thinking, oh, they have an open position here or they are not. Think what you really want to do and go for it, no matter what. So that would be my, my advice. Yeah. Can I just comment? Like, I, I totally agree with that. Like, yeah, it's true that my PhD has influenced a lot, but there is also the fact that I don't see myself as a PI. So that's one reason why I didn't kind of, you know, pursue the kind of postdoc uh, uh, path and so on, because I, I just don't see myself as a PI. So, and then all the other reasons, that's why I kind of uh, like, you know, started uh, looking a bit uh, outside, like at least I don't mind staying in academia if I don't have like, if I have like some not uh, kind of research related, like th that kind of culture, it's, uh, it's a bit like, uh, yeah, but I, I, I agree with you, definitely agree with you that. So I just want to say one thing. Um... And the thing is, as Carmen was mentioning, she finished her PhD with just one paper and she was frustrated about that. And we had this discussion when she moved here, right? Because, I mean, I had a few more than her, but they, they were like reviews and stuff. I was still uh, working on my first other paper from my PhD, but um, I really believe that it doesn't really matter like how you are at each stage. What it really matters is where you want to go and what you want to become. And if you really are passionate, you can do that. I've seen people becoming PIs in very uh, different ways. And so it might be that someone who uh, finished the PhD with 10 publications is not even going to become a PI. So I know that it's the way how we are um, evaluated. And so we feel this pressure, but just remind yourself that um, they are just numbers and how much we value and what we will become, it depends on us. That's what I wanted to say. I also wanted maybe to add um, more or less in line with what Carmen was saying before is that a real direct contact with people is, you know, can make a huge difference. I've probably had all of my interviews so far with people I had somehow uh, known before, you know, met in conference or maybe uh, talked to for either collaboration, etc. And in the end, really all of the, the position I tried to apply to and in the end um, got a position for were coming out of this direct contact. You know, it can really make a huge difference, you know, it's, rather than just you know sending your email and cv alone uh, having this opportunity i know that now in this area it's not that easy anymore because um well everything is frozen uh, but yeah don't don't forget that when you get the chance to to do this kind of uh, events maybe now even the 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 ones that are on the web because we are still doing them but we are doing them on the web but it's still an opportunity to get you know get to know oh, that one might actually be a good 
you know, PI candidate for my next lab or a place where I would like to go because they're doing something cool. So let's try and talk to them. Usually people are, um, I mean, very open to, to talk even to students. Uh, and if they don't, well, that's maybe a red flag. So no bother in that case. <laughs> okay, cool. So we can go on then. And what we wanted to cover now was what kind of skill would you think are necessary to transition as a PI or to be a PI? Because I think that research is a kind of a paradox place where if you do everything correctly from, you know, the moment you enter university to when you finish your last postdoc, there's nothing exactly that teaches you how to actually be a PI. You know, you can have extremely successful university career and PhD and postdoc and if all has gone smoothly you might actually not know at all how it is to be a PI because being a PI it doesn't really concern only doing experiment in the lab or um, planning experiment and so on there's a lot of other skill both hard and soft skill well, it's not to be forgotten that are really, really important to, to become a PI because you have to lead a group of people, you have to manage a group of people, and that's actually not something that is in molecular biology books, unfortunately, until now. <laughs> I think it, it's very important to be diplomatic first because that was one of my um, big struggle here in U.S., because in Europe, we are also uh, passionate and like, you know, how our reaction is yeah, straightforward, yeah. yeah, very honest and straightforward. Well, they don't like it here. Um, so when I arrived, I, I had troubles with that. So being diplomatic is very important to deal with colleagues, students, uh, like the dean of the college where you're working and stuff like that. And then I think the second very important thing is knowing how to allocate the money you have very well and hiring the, the right people. Because if you hire the wrong people, you're done. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, it's true. No, but it's, it's going to so, happen. Totally I think, okay. so, I think it's going to happen at some point. <laughs> yes, probably. So you have but to I, learn also how to deal with, with hiring the wrong people. So that yeah. is like what yeah. to get full, full, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you need to be very strategic at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the thing, and I think that's something because I think that the problem with the postdoc is that many people would advise it to be ultra productive, and you go and you focus and you do your papers and you do everything, and that's what's going to give you a position. And unfortunately, it's true. That's what is going to give you a position. No one is going to look at how good you are leading people or how good you are managing this and that or how good you are at other things. The only thing they're going to consider is how much you published and how much money you are able to bring. That are the two main things they're going to look at. And that is very dangerous, obviously, because I remember having this discussion with the director of my institute because I was saying, I was complaining that we didn't have a, a career plan or we didn't have like a program to teach us to, to become PIs if we wanted to become PIs. And he told us, but look, that's not what they're going to make you, make them hire you. They're not going to hire you because you do this course or because you learn this and you learn that. And I told him, yeah, you're right. That's not, that's up to me and I have to work on that. But later when I arrive to the work, if I want to succeed, I need to know how to do these things. And this is my moment to be prepared for that moment when I arrive there. And that's the difference. The goal, the end goal is not to get the job. The end goal is to do the job of a PI in the future. And that is a very big difference in perspective of what you want to do, I think. At least for me. And after we had the discussions, what he is like supporting us a lot to try to develop this uh, postdoc association to try to do, develop these workshops and these things. Because I think he, he agreed that I had a point that that's something we need to develop. So for instance, for me now, I'm doing this uh, leadership training. It's a business my PI is starting. So I'm not here like, I don't get any money for get, telling you this. But I think that it's very useful because she's like trying to tell us, okay, how should you hire a person? What are you looking for in the people you're hiring? Because another thing you need to have very clear is which are your values. So what counts for you? Because as we were saying, there are like many different ways of being a scientist and all of them are right. There's not like one way. 
but you need to think if that way fits with you because if not then it can be a disaster and it's not the employee's fault it's not your fault either and the other thing is also if you want to see these first years of your pi as a an investment in the sense they're going to give you some money. You can decide to save all that money to make it last a long time, or you can really invest it in, in paying people and have a good team from the very beginning. That's also something you need to consider how you want to do things. Yeah. So these, uh, (laughs) (laughs) it's very fun. (laughs) Yeah. My BI is not finding anything. I don't think she knows, she even knows I'm doing this. So. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, so you mean it's unpaid sponsorship? Oh, damn it. (laughs) <laughs> no, I mean, definitely, so the recently uh, these uh, courses for lab managing or just managing overall has started to invade a little bit the world of, um, you know, biology research, and that's definitely a good trend. I have attended, I have the luck to attend to one of these courses organized by the EMBO, um, and that's actually because, so I've had uh, an EMBO fellowship. And as part of the perks of this fellowship, all of the people that get it are invited to attend to one of these courses. They can be attended by anyone. Uh, They are quite expensive though. Um, We are talking about, I think, 2,000 euros per four days of training. Uh, So it's, yeah, it's on the high end of uh, the the training that you can get. uh, that was actually a very good experience and it was really covering a lot of things that are not at all mentioned in any way in your normal you know in your normal path in uh, in academia but they're very but they're also very very useful even if you know you think well you know you do some kind of training like this it's uh, like a week or something you're not going to become an expert yeah but you think it's going to put in your head the you know you're going to have the, the the small tiny question that pops up sometime when you talk to people when you want to maybe when you would have the chance to be hiring someone or when you have to you know to deal with how to do communication with people that are let's say within the committee or uh, that are your colleagues or as the different pi and so on and you start to think okay I'm not, approaching this communication in the proper way so am i speaking to someone in a way that is going to give me the best chance to get what i want because unfortunately communication is not at all only about the message but there is at least four different you know parts in communication one is the message one is the person that communicates the other is the person that receives the message and then there is the context all of these have a huge impact on the success of your communication like if i want to tell you something that is exact you know extremely appropriate for me to tell you in the way that is appropriate for me to tell you well just to make an extreme case but i am going to have a very very different result if i tell you this you know at work or if i come and knock at your door and try to tell you this. That's not gonna work, probably. I think in a way we could take the the, the same argument that we made the last time on how to uh, go to a job interview and apply it in reverse when you know you want to, uh, when you are the PI and decide to hire a person. You know, because you want to look for exactly the same thing. So if you want to do it properly, uh, you are going to give you the best chances you can get to get a person that is going to, first of all, fit in the environment that you have, uh, your lab, whether it's big or, uh, or small. You want to make sure that this is a person that not only brings you the knowledge and, and the know-how that you want, but it's also a person that you are going to have, um, let's say, not fun, but you know, you're going to have a good time to deal with daily. If that doesn't happen, then it's kind of on you if you lose this chance. And uh, so this is also an important thing. Don't just look at the CV of the person that comes there, but really see how they interact with the people that are around. 
Yeah. I just wanted to add something very quick and that was related to what Christina said before about being political and also about what Carmen said about um, that the, the really important things are the research and the funding. I agree with both. I think that the, the cut is made on research and funding, but then once you get to the interview, you are like all equal. At least this is what more or less all the committee members told me, uh, the people that I know that are part of the committee. So at that moment, like in the moment of the interview, um, you are not judged anymore based on your research only. Actually, you're judged very little on your research because you're judged more on, on the soft skills. So on, on the type of person you are, or the other initiatives that you did during your postdoc or whatever. So in that moment, I think that is the only moment of the job process, the interview process that you are evaluated also, evaluated also for the person that you are. Yeah, if I can add something about the interview, this is more for the American, I think, and mm -hmm. a bit for some of the Anglo-Saxon systems. And I think that also, uh, Elia told me that in Switzerland, they do it like that. One big difference that they have here in the States that I discovered is like the Chalk Talk. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you all know what it is. When you're interviewing to become a PI, there's one part where you're giving a seminar and you're explaining what you have done. So what you have done depends a lot on your previous lab. So what your mentor tells you and which were the topics that were available there and all these things. So you can be ultra successful and not have no clue of how to design your own research. That is a fact. So what they have here. And it's normally not the case. I mean, if you're great, you're great. That's not normally the case, but it could be the case. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, later, the uh, other thing I have here in the state that I find very useful is the chat talk. So in, in, in there, what it does, they give you a whiteboard or a blackboard, in my institute at least a whiteboard, and you need to put there your plan for your research, your own lab, for the next year. So you need to be able to bring up to the explanation of what you want to achieve, what you, which type of funding you want to get, how you want to get it, and explain to them and make it convincing and answer the questions they could have as the reviewers that are reading your proposal. So having the opportunity to go to these chalk talks is amazing, but it's very unusual because normally they don't allow postdocs to be in there. It's something I find personally very frustrating but I think it's a good uh, exercise. So for instance, for me, in, in my system, I'm suggesting now if they could like give us a workshop on how to do that. I had the opportunity to go to some chat talks, fortunately, because they allowed me to go. But I think that's what, similar to what Karen was saying, at that point, you are a future PI and you need to go and sell your science. And it sounds terrible to say sell, but it's true. You need to market your science. You need to go and say, hey, I'm able to do this and this is exciting and this is cool and this is important for the community. So try to understand which are the gaps in the community that the people that are evaluating you are going to perceive to. So what do you think that that department that had those people think it's useful? Because for instance, it happened to in my institute recently, uh, we had an open position for a GLIA center. And there was a, in my opinion, a very good candidate and she was working with microglia and she had a K99 that is a transition award there's in the States and it's very good because it, your first years are of, of, of PI are covered and you also have some money to start your funding and everything. And she had great publications and everything and she didn't get an offer, but it's not that she didn't get an offer. She was not even the first or the second or the third to get an offer and she was awesome. And I think that part of the reason is that she was working with microglia, but all the faculty that is in the glial center in my institute were with astrocytes. So they are not that excited about that kind of research. And that it's something you need to keep in mind. You need to really close the bridge of what they want and what you can give them. You can really make the make them find you like the best chance for them to 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 answer questions in the field, I think. Yeah, so on being a fit, I think uh, there's probably you no know, I have more or less a model in which you can try to find two extremes of, uh, of a curve, which is one, you manage, you know, you have a topic and you manage to find the institute that really works on that topic and so on. Everyone is super happy to, you know, to welcome you and, and so on because, you know, you're part of the family. And then on the other hand, you can just um, go in a place that does, let's say anything in terms of topic but maybe that fits perfectly the approach you want to use. And they are going to not care at all whether you study plants, aliens, or ants, or whatever. 
but they are going to care a lot. The fact that you know you are going to uh, be another person that will bring knowledge and that will build on this uh, community that they are probably building on that specific technique or that specific approach or technology or whatever. And you know, I think that both uh, extremes are going to and are going to give you points, you know, in, in, those, bo in both of those streams of a curve, you're going to find a good fit of, um, of your research. And on the, same, let's say on the same topic, I want you also to share a paper with you, which is just a way uh, to underline what I'm going to say now, which is it's very, very hard to select for excellence. And people are more and more realizing that, meaning that uh, the people that are recruiting, once they do the first, you know, the first round of selection, when they realize, okay, these are all very, very good candidates, they are probably going to do really good research. From that first selection, then it's really, really hard to predict which one of these people is going to be actually the best at doing that. Um, so this paper, in fact, that I'm showing you is a paper that comes from, I think, a 10-year uh, period of uh, survey of people that got this postdoc fellowship. Um, you know, it works like most of the fellowships. You have a first selection, and then you have a second peer review selection that gives you actually the fellowship. So what they were doing was to check between the people that got in the first round of selection and track in 10 years how many of the one that they actually gave them um, the fellowship were able to achieve uh, excellent results compared to the one that didn't get uh, the fellowship. And they ended up saying, well, it, we could have just have thrown dice. You know, the way we predicted wasn't different from a random choice. And this is not the only paper that they've seen about, uh, that they've seen that goes in the same conclusion. So people are getting more and more in the mind frame of saying, once we know that these people are good, we don't just have to you know, make sure that they're really, really good, but they are good and they are also good to work with. They're good for our institute, or they're good for us as a person. And this is absolute, I mean, this makes absolutely sense. So um, you have also to think about this when you plan to apply to somewhere is, uh, am I going to be a good fit for them? And maybe you want to just train yourself and explain why. Because if you go in there without a kind of narrative of why you will fit in that place, then you're going to probably invent stuff at that moment and this is not going to be effective. So just have the time and the energy to digest that narrative and put it out in a coherent way. If no one has other things to add to the topic, we can go to, I think, the last main topic for today, which is how to build your CV for both academia and non-academia. So there's a lot of elements that actually, I mean, probably you might have done already application for either PhD or postdocs or whatever. And you know that there's a lot of elements that go into an application, that go into a CV. There's a little bit of difference when you want to build something like that, but for job application that is outside academia. So we were thinking to just go through this list of objects that you might need and gather some thoughts of why are they different and how they are different. There's a quick question. How many of you have uh, written already uh, grants either for PhD or postdoc position, et cetera? So yeah, we have a few hands. I can also raise mine. <laughs> you probably know already how an academic application should go through. It's usually very, very structured. Even your CV, you usually have the exact place to fill with the exact information. And they mostly deal with how you have been, let's say, awarded something, how you have been, you know, awarded the publication, how you have been awarded anything like that. That's usually the main thing that an academic CV wants to highlight. If you want, for some reason, to switch path and uh, now we go outside of academia, then you have to think exactly in the same, in the opposite way. You have to think about what do I know? What are my skills 
uh, not necessarily that people have you know recognized to you in terms of publication because a lot of places outside academia don't really care about publication maybe they care about publication in terms of track record let's say you say that you're good at that thing do you have just you know something that is linked that we can go and that can vouch for that as well and they don't really care about whether you achieve the best result of your lab or whatever. They want to see that usually what their mind frame is that we need to acquire someone that has a certain set of skills. And we want to find a CV that tells us this. And also the other additional problem is that most of the time, non-academic job pass through not necessarily a recruiting process that is internal. So they are usually given to... Uh, an external contractor and they might not necessarily know a lot about biology or whatever is the field that you're doing so they are given a list of things that they need to check for and you have to adapt your cv so that they are easily accessible for them to see you know they can really easily track okay this person has actually done what my contractor is asking and I can see it clearly from the CV and I can see clearly that there is something that they got as a result that is linked to that uh, to that specific skill. So I can tell, you know, the, the person that is recruiting, well, I've seen that there is something that vouched for him as well in this skill. So, and then another thing that they usually ask outside academia is a resume. And this is super important because usually our CV tend to really be long and probably boring to read for someone so the way that let's say the almost everyone else in the world does this is to use the resume and the resume is usually just a one page only don't go more than one page usually it's formatted also is in a kind of a nice and graphic way it doesn't have to contain a lot of information but it really has to highlight how you match the position you're applying for so it doesn't necessarily have to have um, all of your history don't care about it if there's something that let's say doesn't necessarily match what you are being asked for don't put it in they will ask anyway for uh, for your whole history because imagine that this is something that just needs to push you at the top of the list for being recruited among probably other hundreds of people that are being looked for in a very, very short period of time. This is also the other difference that recruiting outside academia has, is that the timing for recruiting and evaluating a person is very, very short. If you imagine that a, you know, a grant application usually takes at minimum six months to go through and yeah it can have up to let's say maximum a thousand application when they look for a job outside academia you know they put the job out and in a month they want to be done with it they don't don't want to deal with it anymore so maybe the numbers are less but in, you know imagine that probably the person that is looking at your resume is looking at it transversely and if it doesn't find what matches exactly you're not going to get the chance to get to an interview and that is also where you're going to actually show what you know but if you don't get this chance just because your uh, cv was an you know immanuel kant uh, thing then you're losing just opportunities thank you eli i think you are one of the most experts here to uh, share with us <laughs> these things i have one uh interesting thing that i just found out because a friend of mine here she's applying for jobs in industry and i had no idea about this thing that i'm about to tell you so I, I don't know if that's something in US or also in Europe, but I she told me that if a person within the industry, within the company, refers to you, like puts up something which is called a referral or something like that uh, for you, then you have like a preference route to get through the interview pro process. So if you can get to know somebody inside, then your CV or resume or whatever just goes on top of the list and then you'll be called for sure for the interview. Then it's not sure that you're going to be hired, but at least you're going to have more chances to get the interview. And she didn't know. She found out after many applications that it was easier that way to like make friends or like ask friends that were already inside the companies because they trust more 
on the human point of view like that is the opposite of academia actually that it's like they care more about how you are <laughs> so that's, that's so yeah. if you ever go to industry you can have a business of offering your referral for other people you know there's always a good time i'm joking but i thank you very much for the <laughs> but not too much <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that something about academia, I, I was, I, I kind of find this article anymore, I try to, but there was like this uh, comment, I think it was in Nature Careers or some of these ones, that they were mentioning how bad we as scientists are at selling our skills in general to industry, because we are problem solvers, that's what we are, but instead of telling them where I'm a great problem solver and I have a degree in problem solving, what we tell them is, oh yeah, I know how to measure the long leg of, a, I don't know, a stick or something like that. It's like super specific. I, they don't care about it. They will never ever use that, you know? So that, that is, that is the, 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 the type of things that you really want to tell them. It's like your skill that you have developed, but we are not good at seeing that because we're an environment where everyone does that. Yeah, Emma yes, listening to everything and later don't saying anything. I don't know if she finds it like super boring or something. <laughs> oh no, I'm just listening. I'm I'm a PhD student, but I just wanted the input, so I'm kind of just paying attention and and I'm very quiet anyway. <laughs> I, I was I was wondering if Tahira had other because she's had other suggestions because she's also like looking in the industry as far as I understood. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, like all of the things that I've said, like keep it short. And the last point that Carmen too, as she has in <laughs> said, it's actually very, very, very true. Like that we have the issue, like I had to learn how to present myself. We had the issue with the terminology as well. Like you need to put things like time, man time management, project management, uh, uh, stakeholder management, all these kind of things that are kind of words used in the industry. And that we don't use maybe or at least i wasn't using in academia so that that's true and very important is like uh, make every cv or resume like adapt to the job like point out those things that the job is asking and so on so it's it's a lot of work every time like you you apply because you need to put thought in that and adjust every kind of application to that uh, there's comment commenting one thing for postdoc learn how to say no yeah. She touched True. a very important point that we didn't speak about, <laughs> the time management. Yeah. Yeah. We should learn that too, even in the exactly. research. <laughs> yeah, time management is a thing I think I, I learned that is most more useful for my, for my postdoc. Because I, I, I was saying that the other day, now I spend so much time like just planning and organizing that later it pays off. But I didn't do that in my, in my PhD. I, I, I was mentioning this to Elia and Carmen before I was like, running all over the place my my PhD. I don't know how I did it. I wasn't I wasn't planning as I do now. I, I thought I was very organized. In fact my PhD supervisor told my, my, my current PR I was very organized. But I think about me like two, three years ago and I say, oh no, I mean I was a total disaster. So so you really prove this. You have to prove this when you're yeah. working in academia, I think, because you have every time more things on your plate. That, by the way, the plate is never going to be empty. That's also something to learn, I think, in your postdoc is things are never going to be fully done. So yeah. don't try to, and you would sleep every day in the lab if you want to do everything you have to do. That's never going to be totally empty. So learn to just cut and say, okay, this is done for today. Or this is today, I'm not going to work on this because I don't want to, and I don't feel that I want to, and it's fine. The world is not going to end. Mm -hmm. That's another lesson to learn to yeah. your postdoc. Or as, what... as we we're saying to the, to the PhD students earlier, even better. <laughs> that is the thing. I think what Carmen was saying also goes a little bit in the context of uh, project management in research, which is every piece of article, every piece of research that you read, you have to remember that it's usually always a compromise because never going to have enough ends you're never going to have enough control experiment or whatever there is always a way to improve on that but there are certain points you have to learn how to say okay this is enough we have to move on because otherwise you know you are going to be stuck forever with something so and the ability actually to to have a story to uh, you know to learn how to you know to to manage how to get the necessary thing just to get the story and then have the story done. This is also a very important skill for 
uh, for going on with you know as a PI or, or even a, even as a postdoc actually because a lot of time usually is a postdoc that decides okay we are going to do this and this and this and maybe the PI is the one that say no we want to do more <laughs> so yeah and this is also a way in which you have to learn to say no you know say no this is when things should end because it will otherwise clash with your plans. Um, whatever they are in terms of timing, in terms of application or whatever, if you miss the opportunity of getting a paper out and then you have to do an application, but your paper is not out yet, well, that's also an opportunity that you do somehow. Yeah, and you know, also if you have a, po a, a PI that hasn't been in the bench for a while, they're going to be like really unrealistic about the timelines, probably, or, or, even if they were, I mean, when you are starting your postdoc, you manage your time worse than when you're finishing. And that's what I want to think because I, my aim is to manage it better. But the, the, the point is that you need to communicate which is your timelines and you need to be realistic about them. And there's nothing wrong about taking longer to do some tasks that you need to, because sometimes the deadlines that they give us, they are not realistic. So you need to communicate them. So yeah, exactly. Elia, that's exactly what happened. They, especially if they're not exactly from your field, I think they are very unrealistic sometimes. And if they haven't been in the lab for, for, for a while, they just remember how you have to do it. They put this time edit and they say, oh yeah, that takes like two hours. And maybe it takes like three days, you know? So that it's fine to say no about deadlines too, as Carmen was pointing out. Yeah, yeah I wish I had learned that. Um, like when I came out of my PhD, we submitted my paper initially to Nature just to like see if it would go. And an editor got back to us and was like, we like it. We wish you had X, Y, Z. And we, so I was like, okay, I'm going to stick in this lab for another few months, get X, Y, Z done, submit it again. So I did X, Y, Z, submit it again, got through that editor, got to another editor. They're like, okay, now we want $200,000 of sequencing experiments. And <laughs> my PI was like, okay, let's spend six more months and do that. And we ended up just cutting it and submitting where we submitted, which was great in the end. But I spent six, seven months in my PhD lab that I have to spend there. I mean, had it ended up in nature, it would have been amazing, but I, I honestly don't think it would have because there would have been more, always more that you can do. Um, yeah, so learning when a story is done is such a big thing, I think. Yeah, that's challenging. Yeah. So one day we will do a session about young PIs, I think, but today it's about postdocs. But just going to cut the, the story, I think it's important. And I think we need to wrap up. And I was wondering if anyone wants uh, to have like a last advice to mention the last thing, I don't know. Uh, well, I, I will ask something then. So um, basically I'm writing my dissertation like right now, I have another computer here. I'm writing, I'm finishing my dissertation. I'm gonna submit it next week. And the week after I'm moving to the Netherlands from Italy to do my first postdoc, to start my first postdoc. So since here we have many very skillful <laughs> and wise uh, postdocs, I was wondering if you have like a really, a quick tip about what should I expect, like moving labs, starting a new project, uh, in another country that's different from mine, you know. Uh, okay. What, what's the first thing that I should do? Like? <laughs> the first thing is you're going to feel super stupid, but you are okay. not, okay? You, that's what happened to me. I arrived the first day and the undergrads were teaching me the stuff. And I say, undergrads for us, like the people, the, 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 the bachelor students, you know, the, 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 the quality of final laurea. Yeah. So, they were, they were really teaching me where everything was, how they did the immunohistochemistry. They were teaching me like all the stuff and I felt like so stupid. It went over, I went over that like in one or two months, but at the beginning, that's how I felt. So don't feel a failure because you feel like that because it's normal and you are going to feel it. I'm 100% sure that it's going to be the case. It's like that. You need to really adjust to that. You also need to adjust to the language that for you is going to be another challenge because you also have like Dutch around that is not that hard. Don't worry, you're going to be fine. At least in my opinion, it doesn't sound like impossible. That's my- Well, I was told that everyone in the Netherlands talks English. So 
I'm yeah, like yeah. I feel where, where pretty confident going? about that. Uh, Leiden. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No. Um, my husband was packing, hey. so that's why I was asking <laughs> where you were going. But yeah, that's the, my first advice. Don't disappear. You're going to be. You're going to feel stupid. You are not. <laughs> okay. I agree with everything Carmen said, and I have a follow-up comment on the cultural shock that you will experience. Whatever, I mean, whatever country you're going to, even if you're going to like Switzerland, which is very close, probably culturally not even that close to Italy. I mean, whatever, even if you go to Spain, let's say, because yeah, Italy and Spain are very close, but you're always going to find something very different and that is going to impact your life in the first month. Like for instance, well, I came here and I thought I knew English, but I knew like British English, so I didn't know American. And that was for me a very bad impact because I honestly, and, and, and people do not believe me because they probably they hear me speak now and I understand 100% of everybody speaking now, but at the time I was like just being silent. I was just replying with yes and no when I understood most of the things, but I honestly, I was understanding, I think, less than 50% of whatever people were telling me because of the accent. I found it in, extremely difficult in the first month. And, and I was like going back home and feeling like such a headache. And I was especially not in the lab because in the lab they were like from all different places. So the accent was kind of easier for me. But when I was speaking with Americans, like in, in the shops and or in the street or like with, with Americans in the lab, and that, that that really made me feel a little bit like stupid because I was like, come on, I did a PhD in an international institution. All my PhD was in English. I'm supposed to know English. My my boy my boyfriend at the time, my husband, he did a PhD in Oxford. So I was visiting him and I was speaking with people there and I was understanding that. So that was totally a shock to me. So just expect whatever weird thing can happen to you. And that is fine. And that is going to be adjusted in a couple of months. So no worries. You're going to handle it. Just do not be, just embrace it. Embrace the uncertainty at the beginning yeah. of life. I general. didn't even say how, how to say graduated cylinder in English. I mean, these are the things that I, I, my lab, everyone was Spanish. We spoke Spanish the whole time. My dissertation was written in Spanish. <laughs> and later I need to use everything that was in the lab. I, I want that and I couldn't say the word. It was extremely frustrating. It was very, very frustrating. And you're going to have to deal with that. But you're going to be fine, believe me. You're going to be fine. I mean, I still sometimes joke with my lab mates and I tell them that what Elia was saying, I you should see how smart I am in Spanish. I always joke about that because <laughs> that's another that's like another challenge that you might have. Like Especially when you to... get mad and you really want to say something and, you're, and, and to me like English always sounds so polite because this is not my language. So I can never, that is probably helping the political side that we were discussing yeah. earlier because yeah. we would never get angry for real like oh, English. But on the other hand, this is, there are a lot of studies about how when you are not speaking your first language, you are not able to put the same filters that you have uh -huh. uh, in your first link. So oh, there are things that you develop socially. So you know there are cer certain things that you cannot say. When you are speaking a second language, it's very likely that you can have them developed. And these are like studies about violent wisdom and all these things like about how that works. So you will have less filters. Be careful about that because you can really- But I, I don't have filters in Italian. <laughs> so uh, that's not a problem. Okay, <laughs> good, good. I mean, that's a pretty, oh, that's another thing. My husband was living in, in the Netherlands for one year and a half and he's Italian. So that's what I know that is going to happen to you probably. They are, with, you think Italians are straightforward? Try to see Dutch. I mean, wow, they really go like that. They have no filter at all. I mean, be ready for that. They can tell you like the most terrible thing and they don't take it personally. That's the nice aspect of it. But that's yeah, I wish I Fabian was here to comment on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was thinking that. about that. Yeah. yeah. You can ask him a bunch of things, yeah. Mm. yeah. I should meet him for coffee then, next month. Oh, coffee. You don't want to meet him for coffee, no. No? <laughs> for tea. For yeah, tea. better what tea. Drink? Yeah, Dutch coffee, you don't want that. No. <laughs> so I, I should bring some Italian coffee then. Bring your Nespresso with you, or you can yeah. also bring like some Lavazza and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> talking know, about yeah. cultural shock, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, that was great. <laughs> so I think, yeah, we can wrap up. So thank you really, everyone. It was a lot of fun. I'm sure 
most of you will join for the next uh, meeting, which is going to be next week, right? Right, yeah. Carmen? Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> I wasn't yeah, sure Carmen, about it. Carmen and Carmen will be co-hosting. Yeah. We'll be co-hosting. Yeah, we're very excited for that. It's going to be about maternity and paternity, how to in deal academia. with that in academia. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We're going to learn. We're going to have a, a researcher that had triplets. So <laughs> that worse is than that, it cannot challenge. happen, right? So worse than that, I don't think we can go. I don't if even... You can do, if you can do that and still be a PI, I think that there's... A so successful PI. It's not just a general PI. Like. So what else? Uh, thank you very much and good luck to Alessandra. Or when she's... It's next week when you're moving? Uh, yeah, in 10 days. So... <laughs> Good luck. You're going to do Good amazing. Luck. Let us know how it Thank goes. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'll be um, probably at some point connect be connected from there, from Leiden. So I will we'll see yeah, tell you boxes. how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Thank All you very right. much. So, bye. Everyone, Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.